Hey everybody, welcome on our channel. In this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was the emperor of the galaxy and got harem. Part 2. If you are new on the channel, don't forget to subscribe our channel and like the video too. So without wasting any more time. Let's start the story. Politics, officially, is a clean, honest business meant to help lead the public into greatness, promising peace and security to the people they serve. Of course, that's the textbook definition that nobody bought anymore. Underneath all the makeup and fake smiles was an entire system of corruption, blood money, and half-truths and half-lies the one constant throughout history, time, and even space. It was unfortunate, but the modern government and society were much too twisted and much too poisoned to try to play angel when surrounded by nothing but demons. Everyone with a hint of decency were quick to learn this, with even some of the modern crime lords the galaxy feared reluctantly accepting this grim truth. Despite this, even criminals obey certain laws. They all followed certain unspoken rules to avoid an all-out war, since even the scum of the galaxy needed some peace and quiet. Of course, in order to uphold some of these laws, a government needed to be formed. And since nobody wanted to constantly look behind their shoulders 24-7, the crime lords all agreed on democracy, a perverted form of the current republic, and together, they formed an uneasy alliance called the Shadow Collective. Dabba the Hutt, of course, served as the representative of the Hutts and of his people. Bolani, a crime lady who was infamous for hiring mainly Mandalorian bounty hunters, served as the representative of the Quarren race, who were often called squid heads. She had a rather semi-hostile rivalry with Jabba, hoping to one day trump him in the spice trade race. And so on and so forth. All in all, the Shadow Collective was made up of pretty much all of the major crime syndicates across the galaxy, which included, in order of power, the Hutt Clan, the Zagerian Kingdom, the Pike Syndicates, the Black Sun, and the Cremora Syndicate, with the last group mainly consisting of a group of small criminal gangs that formed together in a hasty but successful attempt to join the Collective. It was a no-brainer that none of these groups liked each other, but they had three important rules that they always followed. 1. Do not initiate conflict with one another. 2. Keep the Shadow Collective a tightly guarded secret. 3. Answer the call whenever activated. The call was essentially an emergency meeting that could only be used during times of crisis, be it the official government breathing down their necks, a band of vigilantes attempting to overthrow the Collective, or if one of their own was declaring war on each other. Currently, this meeting was taking place in Gardulla Hut's palace, where virtually all of the criminal overlords were present in the meeting room, be it via hologram or in person. So, what is it, Lom Pike? Jabba's hologram sighed in his native tongue. It was 4 a.m. in the morning for him, and he never was a morning person. The hangover from last night's banquet certainly did not help with his already grumpy mood. The elder Pike just stood there wordlessly, his body swaying back and forth like a scarecrow in the wind. Such an insolent old man, Aruba the Hut scoffed. You know the consequences of pointlessly summoning this meaning, don't you? Death, right. The elder Pike's head snapped upwards with a loud crunch. His eyes glowing red. Everyone in the room yelped as the pike began to let out a hoarse laughter. Who are you? Jabba demanded angrily. What is this nonsense? The bewitched pike let out a dry cackle as he cracked his neck. The name's Darth QB. And this puppet show is just a mere demonstration of one of the many things I can do. In this case, this poor fellow was so rude to me, rejecting my offer, even though I took the time to give a well-planned speech. So I decided that perhaps actions would speak louder than words. He's dead, isn't he? Mirage Sintel, the queen of Zegeria, finally said after recovering from her moment of shock. Her golden eyes glared bravely into the glowing red eyes of the walking puppet, making him chuckle. Correct. However, I don't believe in wasting resources needlessly, so I decided to give this pitiful old body one last use. But enough showing off. As I said before, the name's Darth QB, and I am a Sith the natural enemy of the Jedi. I'm sure you've all paid attention in your history lessons, yes? Nobody dared to speak, but the pitiful whimpering from As Morrigan, the slovenly Jablogian who was currently representing the Cremora Syndicate in person, told him all he needed to know. Eh, hey, good enough. So, let's cut to the chase. I have control of Death Watch, one of the largest groups of Mandalorian warriors. And I need a lot more hands on deck in order for my dream of conquest to happen. You in? Dabba the Hutt grunted out a sentence in swift return. MMM, no credits, unfortunately. I, however, am not asking. No, I'm telling you to either work under me in return for the glorious future, or die. This earned him a mix of scoffs and laughter, before various men and women suddenly sprung up from behind the large desks. M.M., all right, have it your way. Without warning, the holograms of the other Shadow Collective members vanished, with some of them leaving with a look of horror and a scream. This left the ones physically present, except for Jabba's hologram, to stare at the empty seats in confusion. Boom. 
The guards and the shadow collectives alike ducked or yelled as the entrance to the meeting room exploded. Out of the smoke and fire came out an army of Mandalorian warriors as they unleashed blaster fire and flames onto them. The Twi'lek mercenary that moved to defend Aruba the Hutt met a grisly end as he and his colleagues absorbed a wave of fire. The second wave that foolishly moved in was gunned down immediately. Fall back, fall back. Sugi shouted as her group led the other huts into safety. You fools, wait for me. Aruba squealed, but just before they could return for him too. Trieck. Boom. Aruba let out a wail as he was knocked onto his stomach. One of the Mandalorians had fired a missile between the hut and the bounty hunters, knocking the two parties away from each other. The female bounty hunter looked between the hut and the armored warriors before she took off with her group. The Mando Funkers. A weak way shrieked before a golden blaster bolt nailed him in the head. A Gamorrean joined him as his arm slowly attempted to cut down a helmed warrior, only to let out an ear-piercing shriek as it felt a glowing black blade sever its body into two. God damn, this lightsaber's beautiful. Darth QB grinned, staring at the darksaber in his hands. He then flung it to his right, where it pierced a nameless hut right through his thick skull. No. Sugi shouted in horror as their client fell down onto the floor dead. The darksaber yanked itself out of the giant pile of fat, returning to its new master's hands. Ah, don't mourn his pitiful life, the Sith sked with his new saber. I just reduced the obesity rate in this galaxy by 15% by doing what the Republic should have done years ago whoa. He was forced to duck, deflect, and leap over a flurry of blaster bolts as the bounty hunter group that failed to safeguard his life began to rain their vengeance upon him. Rahab and Sabine moved to back him up, but he just raised a fist at them. Don't worry about me, ladies, I can handle them myself. The two warriors obeyed as they lowered their guns. If the princess of the Ren clan wasn't wearing her helmet, the Sith Lord would have been able to see her glaring at him, praying that these bounty hunters would be the ones to gun him down. Sadly, though, her hopes were dashed as he charged right at them. Deactivating his saber, he expertly dodged a hailfire of blaster bolts before charging at the Zabrak bounty hunter. It was all she was able to say as he landed a nasty punch onto her. She managed to block it with her arm, but she let out a shriek as a faint crunch erupted from her forearm. Wham! The leader of this mercenary group was sent flying with a gut-wrenching uppercut, with Lats Razi and Embo catching her. Embo frantically checked her vitals while Razi moved to avenge her friend. You bastard! She screamed as she whipped her grappling bow at him. The weapon scarf moved with blinding speed as the deadly weapon whipped right for his throat. Crunch! Razi let out a nasal yell as she was kicked back a few meters. Everything smelled and tasted like metal, and she didn't have to touch her nose to know that it was broken. Embo and his companion looked down at their fallen companion, looked up at the Sith, then charged with a yell. His canine companion snarled as his dagger-like teeth aimed for his legs. P.O.W., P.O.W., P.O.W. The Sith had to leap back as a furious wave of blaster bolts were unleashed from the bounty hunter's bowcaster. He spun around, kicking Embo's pet out of the way as contorted his body to dodge another round of blaster bolts. Enough. He suddenly began charging forward, having enough of this little game. Embo raised his blaster again, but stopped as he saw the Sith Lord pick up his beloved pet by the throat. Upon seeing his companion let out a choked whine, he dropped his weapon and charged at the man himself. The Sith Lord tossed the beast aside, and the two men clashed with their fists. Gloved hands slammed into each other's body, hitting armor, clothes, and bare skin. Embo let out a curse in his native tongue as one blow nearly stopped his organs. Do weak. The Sith growled as he blocked a haymaker, countering with a brutal headbutt. The metal hat took the brunt of the brutal attack, but it still sent the bounty hunter crumpled to the floor, the shield now bent terribly. Embo let out a pitiful moan as he struggled to stay awake. Rahab stepped up with her finger on her blaster, but her master raised a hand. She drew back her blaster, and the three of them watched as the mercenaries limped away, occasionally staring back at the Sith master in fear. They're mercenaries, my dear. The minute their contractor died was the minute their loyalties did as well. Besides. He turned back to see a whole group of fallen guards and hired guns scattered throughout the floor, their weapons, bodies, and equipment decimated and cut down. Dead men tell no tales. Status report. The male member of Death Watch stiffened as their new leader re-entered the Shadow Collective's conference room. Sir, the Huts and the other Collective members have escaped except for this group. He jabbed his rifle at a group of rounded-up scumbags of the galaxy who were now trembling with their arms raised up. Good work you guys, the wielder of the Darksaber nodded. No worries, the others will come around. But in the meantime. He stepped up to the group of prisoners, starting off with the hut in the room. Give me names and locations of your brethren, and you will be more than welcome to join my future. Aruba the hut whimpered as he managed to let out some weak protests in Hattis. Fine. Then die. S-C-H-V-R-M-M-M-M. 
his crimson and black blade ignited, making the others step back as he moved to execute the hut. New. The hut yelled, waving his stubby arms in the air. Hogwa. Hogwa. Give me a location, then. His lightsaber lowered to the floor, its ominous blade humming dangerously close to the hut's belly. Tatooine. Tatooine. Aruba pleaded. Dabba's palace, Bokate noted. Well yeah, no shit Jabba would be in his palace. The Sith snorted. Come on, I need more than basic funking knowledge. Give me more, or I'll start shaving some fat off of that body of yours if you know what I mean. The hot gulped sweating buckets as he began to spill. They were quite a helpful bunch. The pilot said nothing as they continued watching the hyperspace tunnel. QB, who sat on a metal box, let out a small sigh. Well come on, speak to me here. Geez, what's a guy gotta do to get a nice conversation? They were obviously still a little shook at the fact that he butchered about half of their new recruits after the interrogation was over, and he did nothing to hide the fact that he enjoyed it. Rookies, he suspected. Maybe we can funk instead. Rahab purred. He could feel her large chest that she somehow hit behind all that armor press against his armored back. Eh, sounds like fun. He suddenly turned around, slamming his lips against the tomboy Mandalorian's luscious pear, making her moan. The two pilots were glad that they kept their helmets on, which made peeking at the corners of their eyes much easier. Just as he slid his hands underneath her jumpsuit, they jumped out of hyperspace. As Rahab stomped away, muttering not again, the Sith Lord stared at the desert planet in hunger. Dabba swallowed down a goblet of exotic wine. Letting out a small belch, he ordered his servants to fetch him some more. His hazy eyes returned their gaze to his two prized dancers. One of them was a lovely, green-skinned Twi'lek woman, who foolishly stayed behind to serve him despite being once granted the chance at freedom. The other was a Zeltron woman, whose beauty and virgin status caught his eye. Buying her was a lucky catch, and until recent events, he saw himself as a lucky man. But no matter how loud the music rose, no matter how those lovely slaves of his danced in the dim, blue light, no matter how many drugs or drinks he consumed, it couldn't stop the fear from clouding his mind. Fear. He let out a small chuckle at that word. It has been a long time since he had felt true fear. Fear was the tool his family and countless other crime syndicates used to hold control over the people. It was cheap and easy, and required very low maintenance to enforce. Execute a few people here and there, dangle some carrots and the whip in both hands, and hire a shitload of guns, and your daimyo. That's how the Hut clan rose to power many millennia ago, and that's how they kept it. Looking back, Jabba finally could see how they failed themselves. Time, money, and power has betrayed them, turning them from fearsome warriors into fat, slovenly kings that assumed they could get away with anything by throwing their names or credits at their problems. Don't get him wrong, he and his family always knew that this was always a potential threat and that there would eventually be someone foolish enough to raise arms and raise hell against their family. They just tried their best to not believe it, thinking that their fortune and army of thugs would protect them their power and influence being so great that not even the ancient republic and the Sith dared to cross their paths or simply found them too useful to destroy. It helped that they never did dare to try to leave their territory, their silent agreement with the other two factions being that they minded their own business and they could go along with their petty wars. They just never thought that there would be a growing third faction at play. Just then, his palace trembled as loud explosions boomed in the air, causing the festivities to come to a sudden halt. Ah, this was it. He knew that there was no running from this. Where could they run? They certainly weren't welcomed in any other parts of the galaxy, and their territory was pretty small, especially in comparison to the Republic. And even if that wasn't the issue, pride certainly was. If he ran, then he would either live as a coward or die as one. That was something he and his family refused to do. If anything stuck with them throughout time, their warrior pride certainly did. So this was the might of the Hut Empire. How disappointing. The planet of Tatooine barely had any spaceships protecting it. Even after giving Jabba a good week to prepare since his declaration of his power seizure, all he could muster up for a planetary defense was a handful of gunships that belonged to the Shadow Collective. Sure, it was better than a wall of cargo ships, which was all he had expected, really, but it was just target practice for the Mandalorians. They lost none of their own ships, including the stolen ones, and they invaded the desert planet with ease. It was easy. Pathetically easy. Death rained from above in the form of armored soldiers on jetpacks and spaceship cannon bolts. Parked ships and speeders were the first to go, combusting into large balls of flames and molten shrapnel. Then the guards outside were the first to go, either being blown to bits or being gunned down personally by the Mandalorians. The first round was over before it could truly begin. The large metal doors refused to lift itself to welcome the guests or to try to send more men to stop them. Open the door, Darth QB ordered, and the Mandalorian pilot squeezed their thumbs onto the trigger. 
The Morians might have been stupid intellectually challenged beings, but the explosion that blew the mighty doors open to the palace sobered up the drunken pigmen in a heartbeat. Hobbling to their feet, they grabbed their weapons in a vain attempt to defend their master to the death. Their efforts, while admirable to an extent, were still laughable, as their slow bodies and their foolishly chosen weapons did nothing for them as they were gunned down or cut down by the invaders. The wiser ones fled, retreating to the first room they could find, but the warriors followed them, firing into the rooms to finish the job or simply tossing a thermal detonator before shutting the door. They were worthless scum, hardly worthy of their weapons, but their lord's orders were clear. Dabba downed his goblet as the blaster fire grew unmistakably close. His dim-witted guard slowly stumbled onto their feet to do their jobs, only to be gunned down and even slashed to bits by a unique lightsaber. Hello, Jabba, the Sith purred. Fancy meeting you here. I'm so glad you didn't decide to run. You're much wiser than the rest. He beckoned with his finger, and a few Death Watch troops pushed forward a train of floating crates. Snapping his fingers, they opened it in unison before the Sith kicked the box down. The entire room gasped as the heads of the crime syndicate tumbled onto the floor. Ike, Hutt, Faleen, nearly every criminal overlord in the galaxy's head, joined the gruesome collection, rolling towards Jabba's throne. Their rotting skulls were frozen into an eternal scream, the look of a fallen prey still evident in their molding eyes. Dabba gulped, and he began to speak towards his droid, but the Sith raised his hand. Speak basic, or I'll cut off your tongue and feed it to the rancor below. Dabba nearly choked as he wilted, before he finally relented. What do you desire, my lord? Everything you and whatever's left of your family owns. Credits, spices, connections, hyperlanes, everything. Everyone leapt as the last words seemed to erupt a wave of air around the Sith, creating a breeze of dust and sand. Oh, and in case you get cute the Helm Lord suddenly thrust his hand towards one of Jabba's guests, and a blaster flew towards its new master. Blam. 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 The hut seated next to Jabba let out an agonizing wail as he slumped forward. It didn't take a medical droid to know that another hut was lost in the galaxy. I want Jabba and his guests and minions to line up to the right over there. Slaves and women go to the other. You have 20 seconds before I order my men to slaughter indiscriminately. Now. This sent a flurry of panic as nearly everyone in the palace scrambled to take their place. It mattered not whether they were guests, merchants, or actual employees of Jabba, they all desperately pushed and shoved to the mention spots so that they wouldn't join the others. Even Jabba himself moved in surprising speed as he rushed to save his hide. Within seconds, everyone stood at attention at the Sith's call. Good, good Darth QP nodded in approval. Hey Jabba, come here for a second. Dabba's frail, tiny arms trembled as he quickly made his way towards the leader of Death Watch. Beat up. Harg. Jabba let out a choked wail as his large jaw was seized in the grip of crushed gauntlets. The iron grip yanked the hut's mouth down swiftly, and Jabba let out a plea in a mixture of basic and hatees for the Sith to spare his life. His plea swiftly ended as he saw what was on the other hand. Aw. Aw. A-R-K-G-H. Before Jabba could say any more, a detonator was shoved down Jabba's poor gullet. All his years of tirelessly shoving food after food down his throat has betrayed him as the bomb slid down his maw within seconds. You huts are slimeballs, but not all of you are cowards. That's why I needed a little insurance in case you try anything funny. With one push he took out a small remote that blinked green and red. You're going to have one hell of a heartburn, so from now on, if you so much as want to eat, you ask me first. Understood. Yes. Arg. Jabba let out a pained squeal as the Sith Lord punched him in the eye. Yes, what? Yes, my lord. Please. Mercy. Mercy. That's better. See, looks like you huts can learn something. He gave him a mocking pat on the belly before he walked away. He paused in his steps as if something had just occurred to him. HK. We'll only need half. He didn't spare the men a glance as his droid and death watch gunned down half of the men on the other side of the room. He walked towards the slaves, who shivered and pleaded in random tongues. He simply waved his hands, and their chains and shock collars came off with ease. You're free now. Pack up your things, take as many credits as you can carry, then leave this place. Or stay behind and service my men and become a part of my empire. Your choice. And with that, he walked to Jabba's study room. Two of Jabba's slaves, in particular, glanced at one another, then at the Sith Lord, who had suddenly barged into their miserable lives, and made their choice. Um, even in his studies he has a pile of wealth and food. Shocking. His helmet was often unfortunate sacrifice needed to consume the delicacies on the desk. It was a freshly made dinner that he suspected was always made in preparation for Jabba whenever he retired down here for the night. All of his personal dirty deeds and deals, and he carries it under his pillow. How arrogant. Knock knock. Come in. A small smile made its way onto his lips as two of Jabba's former slaves walked through the door. 
a Twi'lek and a Zeltron. Both were virgins, surprisingly enough. It would appear that this cesspool hasn't robbed them of their delicate aromas that informed him of such. Well now, I wasn't aware of the lovely company. What can I do for you too? Master Sith Valora smiled as she licked her lips, we wanted to thank you for saving us from the hut. He's a disgusting animal, Ula agreed, twirling her leku shyly between her fingers. But Master Sith is a handsome, strong man. Please take us with you in your conquest. Swear your loyalty, he smirked as he rose up, his naked beep already poking out of his trousers, and I'll give you everything you could ever ask for. The two girls nearly fought for the right to get to his manhood first. He chuckled at this, before he told them to learn to work together. They became best friends after this. He gave them a gentle pat on their heads. He hadn't bothered to ask if they were clean nor virgins. As stated previously, virgins held a certain aroma that were quite similar when it came to humanoid species. As for the disease part, modern medicine had taken care of nearly every type of disease out there, with Jabba himself taking care to make sure that his slaves didn't become vectors for some easily preventable disease out there lurking in the vast galaxy. Either way, he discovered that in thanks to his nature before and after Karama's sacrifice, his body had become nearly godlike an eye infinite well of power and energy that consumed any hostile substances that dared to invade the temple. But enough bragging. He had new servants to attend to. They groaned as his milky white semen painted their colored faces. Desiring nothing more than his essence, they frantically tried to take more from the source, sucking, pumping, and squeezing to try to milk out more. When the tap stubbornly would have given them more, they noted just how much was left on each other's faces and pressed lips together. More. More. The two of them turned back to their new master with a hopeful look in their eyes. More. His eyes glowed with excitement as the two crawled towards him, their frees swing back and forward as they prostrated for his manhood. Lemon scene happened. SSH, SHH he murmured into her ear as her small gasps threatened to turn into cries. It'll feel better soon enough. His hand gently waved over her snatch, and she felt her pain being leached out of her body, leaving behind pure pleasure. Cries turned into sighs, and she fearlessly began to speed up her hips. Her soft thin head tails flailed and danced in the air as her body moved in unison with the Siths. Her flesh threatened to melt over the heat of his presence, wanting to merge with him to feel and become one with the walking force of power. All of the women felt it the minute he entered the atmosphere. It was chaos, a flurry of emotions that they had no semblance of thought on how to respond to such a thing. Infusion. Fear. Anger. Hope. Rage. Lust. Joy. Disgust. Bloodlust. So many emotions they haven't felt before. So many emotions they haven't dared to feel since day one of their enslavement. And yet, this walking star of emotions had barged into their lives, and even before he came guns blazing through the door, they had already begun to rebel, determined to show this intruder savior that they held no loyalties to the slimeball. Of course, their handlers did their best to keep them contained, but before they could begin threatening them with death, their savior arrived just in time. Of course, some of them lost their bravado upon being face to face to the walking maelstrom of power, but Ula and Valara. They needed to be a part of his life, even if all that meant was to keep his bed warm. That's why despite how much her deflowered cunt groaned in protest, she slammed her hips into his as she gave a small dance, making sure that her leku and her frieze hypnotized the god underneath her. Even before she gave her maidenhood to him, she made an oath. She swore to be with him at all times to be a good girl, and to make sure that she'll never be under the heel of disgusting filth that'll only serve to darken the galaxy. But this mantis man was destined for greatness. His overwhelming presence his manly body shined brighter than the twin suns that loomed over them. She closed her eyes as he attacked her neck and freests with his mouth. Unable to hold it in any longer, she threw her head back as she came. Darth QB sat on a large stone throne that was placed neatly over what used to be Jabba's throne. He enjoyed basking in the fruits of his labor as Valora and Ula continued worshipping his beep shamelessly in front of everyone else. The Mandalorians that stood guard used all their training to not focus on the beautiful men and women scattered everywhere. Of course, it was much easier to resist looking at such temptations, since once their shift was over, they were promised their share of the spoils of war. As Rahab, Sabine, and HK-47 stood guard around him, he had only one thing on his mind. Who's next? Zegeria is one of the many Outer Rim planets that lurked outside the reach of the Republic. Once a mighty slave empire that inspired and rivaled the Huts, it fell hard onto its knees when the Jedi rained fire on them. It was one of the few instances that the Sintel family truly felt fear. They thought that they had perhaps pushed their luck too far, and now the Jedi were going to inflict their justice upon them for their numerous crimes against the galaxy. Apparently, they had nothing to fear. It turns out that the GD only went after them because they had allied with the Sith Empire at the time, fueling the Dark Empire with countless slaves like a droid factory. 
Evidently, the GD didn't really care much about them afterwards, since many millenniums had passed by, and not once had they lifted much of a finger to do anything about their quiet rebuild. Their fears did arise once again when the Clone Wars had erupted, but just like many times before, the GD did not bother to check up on them to see if they upheld their treaty to stop their practices of slavery. And to think that they called themselves Knights of Peace and Justice. Everything should have been well great, even. The Confederacy of Independent Systems, or rather, Count Dooku and his Sith Master, recently got in touch with them, promising them wealth and security for their future empire as they shook hands. And yet, things were quickly going south. Mirage Sintel, the queen of Zegeria, was rudely awakened by a slave bursting into her quarters, frantically telling her that someone from within the Shadow Collective has initiated an emergency meeting. After giving it a couple of lashes in irritation, she quickly dressed up and exited her guest room to join the other members who happened to be staying in Gardulla the Hut's palace. It was there that she was reminded of the definition of fear. The one who initiated the call was turned to a living puppet, magically controlled by another Sith who desired their resources. She, of course, held her head up high as she expected this intruder to be dealt with. Then the explosion started, followed by a hail of blaster fire. She and the rest, of course, evacuated the minute the ambush started, and although rattled and her dress ruined by dust and spice, she made it back home safely, where she patiently awaited the status of the rebellion. It never came. It had nearly been a week since the attack, and she heard no word from the other collectives about their status. She grew worried. Not for the others, of course, but for herself and for her empire. She robbed the bridge of her nose. Goodness, at this point, she was going to start sprouting gray hairs. Another. She snapped her fingers, and one of her many slaves quickly stepped up to pour her a glass of wine. Barely waiting for the Twi'lek slave to finish pouring, she downed her glass in a hurry, feeling the tension in her shoulders and back starting to dissipate. I is something troubling you, mistress. Her golden eyes opened slowly to look up at the fool who dared to speak to her without her permission. Her rage was halted at the sight of a beautiful Zeltron woman who stood before her. Mirage wanted to stay enraged, if only to keep her reputation, but she was far too busy drinking in the sight of this beautiful specimen. A healthy prime example of the Zeltron race, her beautiful red hair reminded her of the finest wine, her frieze perfect for raising her offspring and for viewing and physical pleasure, her flawless red-pink skin which looked untainted by time nor conditioning, her black and orange metal bikini, which only served to make her that much more tantalizing to ravish. She shook her head. Perhaps she had a little too much wine. Who are you? she frowned. I don't recall you within my collections. I am here as a present from the mighty jab of the hut. She gave a bow, her freests dangling from within their metal cages. I was sent to make sure that the recent events did not shatter your faith in the hut clan and have instructed me to make you as comfortable as possible. She stood straight once more, taking something out from her freests. It was a small device that, when activated, showed the desiligic kajitic symbol. I see. Mirage sighed as her back met her throne more. The mention of Jabba soured her mood even further. While he was a fine business partner, she despised him the most out of all the huts. He always had his eye on not just her property, but her body as well. She caught him once staring at her while she spoke to another collective, and the thought of those repulsive eyes slobbering over her body made her shiver. I hate to see you displeased, my mistress. The Zeltron beauty knelt as she bowed her head. From my thorough education, it appears that you are suffering from mild tension on your shoulders. May I have the honor of massaging them? Sharp eyes, this one has. As repulsive as the hut was, he sure did know how to produce such fine slaves. Very well, Mirage sighed as she leaned forward a little. Perhaps a break from the wine would be good. The slave quietly and obediently made her way behind her, her gentle fingers slowly but oh so ever, lovingly massaging her aching shoulders and neck. Oh my, you've been taught well, Mirage sighed. She felt her troubles melting away, receding to the back of her mind. Thank you, mistress. Goodness, was that her natural scent, or was that some high-grade perfume? Either way, there was just something soluring and relaxing about being in this slave's presence. Do you believe in miracles? This made the queen blink. Pardon? Ah, apologies, my lady. My master told me that I think a lot. He told me that he found it rather endearing, so he never told me to stop. Mirage frowned a little at this. That didn't sound like Jabba at all. Do you want to know what a miracle is, Mirage? This time, her words were quiet haunting. Full of venom. Danger. Her eyes widened and her jaw opened into a scream. But nothing came out. Her body feeling quite limp, she felt her throat closing up, with choked wheezes the only thing that escaped her mouth. Something was wrong. Terribly wrong. Why weren't the guards doing anything? The miracle is like a shooting star. It's something that comes rarely, if it ever does at all. On that star is a tail made of rope. That glowing rope of magic has the power to save a woman from the infinite darkness of the universe. But that rope. 
Her grip on her shoulders tightened, and only a pathetic squeak managed to escape the Zagerian queen's throat. That rope does not allow you to wait to make decisions. That rope is something that comes and goes once in a lifetime, and that rope is gone forever if you miss it. That's why people cling onto that rope even if a star is a ball of red, fiery, anger that'll burn the galaxy to the ground. POW. 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 Mirage couldn't turn her head, but the sound of blaster fire and the sound of loud thuds all around her told her enough. Her body trembled as it struggled to break free from its invisible bindings so that she could run or fight. But her body betrayed her, and the room was beginning to spin. You know, another female voice seemed to echo like a voice in a hallway. As Mirage's eyelids grew heavy, another slave walked into view. Even as her vision turned blurry, she recognized that slave as the one who gave her her wine. The only good thing about us Twi'leks being so beautiful and enslavable is that nobody bats an eye when we show up in chains and a skimpy outfit. Something large fell into view with a loud thud. Statement. Using Ula and Valora Valence as the Trojan horse was an excellent idea. Basic, but very effective. Mirage's head slumped downward, and all she knew was darkness. She awoke to the sound of gunfire and explosions. Good morning, a very familiar voice purred. Or, should I say, good evening. The world was an orange and brown haze, but even as her vision struggled to work properly, she recognized the voice. The Sith. I'm quite flattered that you've remembered my voice, my lady. There are you here to kill me? You? No. Relief filled her heart. It would have been a waste of a fine woman. Her heart stopped. It was then that she realized just how exposed she felt. No. No, 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 no. Her vision had finally returned, but when she looked down, she almost wished it hadn't. Gone was her royal dress made of the finest silk and the purest gold. Gone were her exotic jewelry too, and even her undergarments. Her golden eyes widened, her fair skin reddened as she immediately moved to cover herself up. She looks amazing, doesn't she, master? She turned, and her eyes narrowed a little. It was the Zeltron who she mistook for Jabba's gift. Still in the outfit she saw her in, she was leaning on a human man beside her. She flinched as she finally noticed the towering man inches away from her. He must have been a warrior, judging from his frame, scars, and muscles decorated as large build, with short blood-red hair that seemed to glow in the beaming moonlight. Indeed she does the Sith smirked. For all the ugliness you Zagerians hold in your greasy little hearts, you sure make up for it with physical beauty. He stroked her cheek lovingly, and she felt bile threatening to leave her throat. No, this cannot be happening. She is the queen of Zegeria. Flat. Don't touch me. Mirage hissed. A trickle of phlegm dripped down his chin. For one eerie moment the world held its breath, and she was quickly beginning to regret her outburst. An abnormally long tongue slithered out of his mouth to lick it off. M.M., feisty. We're going to love you. His hand seized her hips at the speed of light, and she felt her body being pulled forward. Her eyes widened as his mouth crashed against hers. MMMPH. Mirage screamed, punching and pushing at him. Her sharp teeth threatened to close down onto his tongue, but her jaw wouldn't respond to her commands. Her eyes burning hot with tears, her throat gagged disgracefully as she struggled to pull air into her lungs. She stopped struggling at some point, falling limp as she decided that she didn't want to be awake for this anyways. Too bad she forgot that Sith could often read minds. He ripped himself away from her, his long tongue pulling out of her throat with a wet splash. Air suddenly began rushing into her lungs, snapping her wide awake. She spun around onto her hands and knees as she coughed, not caring one bit that her own royal bed was being ruined by bile and saliva. Eh, ten seconds. Not bad a sultry voice mockingly praised. Mirage blinked tears out of her eyes as she weakly looked up. A large fat freisted woman with dark skin and long bangs that covered most of her hair walked into the room, naked as the day she was born. My lord. May I show her how it's done. The muscular woman let out a squeal as the man extended his hand, and she suddenly found herself hovering in the air before she floated towards him. In seconds, the woman was on top of him, and the two were making out like there was no tomorrow. They animals. Mirage gaped. Filthy funking animals. She needed to get away. His concubines were too occupied trying to please their master to watch over her. Her eyes quickly moved over to the makeup drawer across the room, remembering the blaster she hid there. She sprung out of bed. And she saw stars. Tasting metal, she realized that she was kissing the floor. Something large and soft was pressed up against her naked back. For a moment, she wondered if one of the concubines in the room had tackled her, pinning her onto the floor. She wasn't completely wrong. My my, where do you think you're going? An alluring voice purred over her. Mirage's eyes widened a little as she finally saw the deadly beauty that had her pinned to her floor. Ah, great timing, Talon Chan, the Sith Lord said cheerfully. We were just about to teach her a lesson about obedience. That should be something that's quite elementary for her. 
Ah yes Queen of Slaves Talon's grin looked absolutely venomous, her glowing yellow eyes gleaming in the dark night. Tell me, how do you feel now? Do you feel high and mighty, knowing that a Twi'lek whore has gotten one over you? Trash will always remain trash, Mirage spat. Even while her naked body was pinned onto the filthy floor, she remained defiant and proud, glaring back up at the red Twi'lek. If you know what's good for you, you would get on your knees and ahhhhh. Darth Talon let out a roar as she leapt off of the Zagerian woman. As she flew gracefully into the air, she stuck her naked hand out, firing off a torrent of deadly blue electricity. It licked at her body like flames onto wood, sending waves of agony through every cell in her body. It hurt it hurt so much. Was this what it was like to be struck by a whip, only a thousand times more everywhere? Every nerve in her body screamed, every strand of every fiber of her was on fire. Her tears were fried from the lightning storm, her body stiffening and yet relaxing from the bombardment of pain. And just like that, it stopped. Even after she stopped seeing the electric blue lightning dancing on her body, it took her forever to finally realize that she was allowed to breathe. The instant she realized this, she finally let out gasps of air that were mixed in with pathetic sobs and chokes. She screamed, her screams sounding hoarse and dry, her body twitching and trembling uncontrollably. She felt her crotch growing wet, and, despite the torture she had just undergone, she blushed, wondering if she had soiled herself. No, slave, you haven't soiled yourself, Darth Talon smirked snarled, emphasizing the word slave. Most people do so, but you. It appears you've quite enjoyed that. Mirage's eyes widened, and she shakingly looked down at her body. Biting her lip, she wanted to either scream some more or just lay there and die. Dying was preferable to the reality set beneath her. What should have been a puddle of urine was instead a puddle of her love fluids. This can't be. Oh yes. Mirage let out a choked gasp as her body was suddenly dragged into the air, like a puppet forced to perform by a cruel master. Her body flew back towards the puppeteer, and right before she would have crashed into the sweating pile of bodies, she stopped just inches away from them. Ah, funk. The muscular human screamed as her fat tits bounced up and down. Her glistening dark skin seemed to shimmer in the moonlight as the two came, her head flung back as she dampened her master's naked chest. You really needed that, didn't you? The Sith purred. The woman said nothing as she fell into his arms, out like a light. Ha, looks like I'm just too good. Gently laying her next to him, his glowing red eyes turned back towards the disgraced queen. Now, then. He lifted his hand again, and she found her body being dragged towards him by an invisible force. Mercy her lips quivered as she finally saw just how large his man thing was. It wouldn't fit. It couldn't fit. But something told him that he'll ruin her virgin body forever. No, he smiled, and then she felt her body drop. Lemon hoppened. The key part of breaking in a slave was patience. It was required if you wanted a reliable slave with minimal chances of rebellion. It mattered not whether they were Twi'leks, beings naturally made and bred for fex and slavery, or a stubborn creature as a Wookiee, proud warriors that would often rather die than submit. Patience was key. One needed to start slow, crumbling their hopes and resistance little by little. The good master needed to not just work to break the slave, but a good master also allows the slave to break themselves. They needed to realize, learn, and accept that there was no escaping their new chains. Mirage knew this better than almost anyone. She had essentially adopted and perfected this practice, passing it on to her subjects. And now she found herself being subjected to it. She wanted to say that she was strong that she had the willpower made of Durasteel to withstand her own enslavement program and that she would come out on top at the end. But the humiliation and pain was too much. The pleasure was beginning to overwhelm her senses, her mind, her goals, her dreams, all disappearing into useless brain fluid as the only thing she was beginning to desire was pure carnal bliss. No, she thought softly, a mere whisper drowned out by the torrent of cortisol, dopamine, and serotonin. I mustn't fall for his Sith tricks. Even as her whisper of defiance managed to let out its quiet croak, she found herself unable to hear its final cry as she climaxed. This one was intense far more so than any other one she ever had in her life. Lightning ran through every synapse in her body, reaching her brain, and just like that, whatever defiance she managed to rebuild crumbled to nothing. Drunk with pain, pleasure, guilt, joy, hatred, admiration, the world began to spin around her. She couldn't think anymore she could hardly remember where she was. All strength was sapped from her body, and she found herself returning to the world of darkness. Ah, bliss. Sweet, sweet nothingness and everythingness. Come to think of it, why was she resisting? Who was she resisting against? She couldn't tell anymore. Not now, and possibly never again. Well, this conquest was fun, Darth QB sighed blissfully. Sitting on what used to be Queen Mirage's throne, the once ruler of Zegeria was on her knees in the middle of the throne room. Plenty of men, Mandalorians, former slaves, and even former guards to the queen, had their way with her. 
Mirage had long stopped pleading and protesting, choosing to sink into the world of twisted pleasure. So gone was she that she didn't even remember her name or title. All she responded to anymore was horror bitch. The former queen was now broken beyond repair, a husk of her former self. And Naruto was so very proud of seeing that. Really give it to the whore, boys, Talon ordered grinning wickedly at the sight of the queen being used. Make sure she gets every single one of your delicious beeps. Much like their time in Jabba's palace, or, now renamed, Darth QB's palace, the Mandalorians were rewarded for their efforts with the finest wine, food, and men and women. Celebrating in shifts, they were enjoying the fruits of their labor. Of course, not all of them partook in this hedonistic celebration. A few, much like Bo Caton, just stood in the background, her frown masked by her helmet as she found the entire thing quite distasteful. They were warriors, not feck starved mercenaries. This was an embarrassment to the name Mandalor. And yet a part of Bo Caton hated how the sight of Rahab bouncing on their new leader's beep made her crotch a bit warm. Doing her best to keep her position as a loyal guard on duty, she resisted the urge to rub her legs together. Unbeknownst to her, Darth QB noticed her subtle twitches of her hands and legs, a smirk forming behind his helmed face. She would fall as well eventually. Just like her Mandalorian sisters did. It was all just a matter of time. For soon enough everything would fall to him. Once upon a time, Mandalor was a planet full of lush life. Once upon a time, Mandalor housed the legendary Mythosaur. Once upon a time, the Mythosaurs were hunted to extinction, becoming the symbol of its future warriors. Once upon a time, Mandalor was a breeding ground for conflict, spawning powerful warriors capable of taking on Jedi and Sith alike. But that was all in the past. Mandalor's forests were no more, the surface inhabitable from never-ending war. Its people, its warriors, its iron were drastically reduced, with the descendants forced to live in large artificial biomass that became the dominant source of oxygen. But now it was just the people. Its warriors were long gone, sent into exile as decreed by the Duchess Atene Kriz, after her faction managed to win the Mandalorian Civil War. The new Mandalorian sought complete peace, inspired by the Jedi and her trauma of watching her family die from the constant infighting of the various clans. The said clans were forced into exile, where they were made to die off on their planet's moon Concordia. Time and time again her pacifism was tested, with various criminals and Death Watch, attempting to end her rule or to simply exploit the now weakened Mandalor. Time and time again they were admittedly lucky, with their watered-down warriors serving as meager police and the occasional Jedi, to help put down any threats it had faced. The day, however, such luck and illusion had faded failed them at their most dire hour. Boom. 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 Screams and shrieks of people erupted as fire rained from the sky, with pirate ships suddenly making their way in. The initial assault was executed in a more stealthy manner, using shipping crates to smuggle the gangsters through. Once the chaos had begun, however, they abandoned the plan of a silent takeover and simply dropped in and charged. The Mandalor police force, of course, bravely did their best to hold the line, but with their main weapons being mere shields and stun batons, with only a handful of them immediately wielding blasters, there wasn't much they could do but simply defend. Despite this, however, the Mandalorian guards proved to be much more of a challenge than expected. Despite their duchess doing her best to eliminate their past barbaric ways, the Mandalorian guards were still warriors at heart, refusing to back down, even as the odds were against them. Some of them admittedly hit or used various weapons that were now publicly frowned upon, due to how their ancestors once used them for conquest. Blaster pistols. Blaster rifles. Even flamethrowers. They used everything they had to hold back the sudden invasion of thugs, buying the citizens enough time to run. But, as courageous as they were, all that courage eventually failed them as one by one they fell. Several of them perished, many of the dead wielding either shields or stun batons, unsurprisingly. And slowly, even the more well-armed guards began to fall. Fall back, fall back. A second in command of his battalion screamed, his voice hoarse as flames sucked what little moisture the air held. Don't let them pog ah. He raised his shield too late, and a red bolt struck him in the neck. He gurgled, wheezing for air as he fumbled to remove his helmet, but dropped dead within seconds. At that moment, every pacifist around them suddenly wished that they had never given up their guns in the name of peace and safety. At that moment, they prayed that someone anyone would save them, accepting anyone or anything that would rescue them as their saviors. Blam. 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 Look over there. A civilian cried out. Is that? Death watch. They watched in fear and awe as the warriors flew into view, their golden bolts raining from above like the bolts of a thousand angels. The gangsters stood no chance, falling like stones as each bolt hit their mark. There were no theatrix, no chances of mercy, no room for negotiation. Just extermination of the threat to their people. And how loudly they cheered as their angels and metal descended, making sure to finish off the enemies before escorting the civilians into safety. Duchess Atene bit her lip. 
It has been 30 minutes since the army of gangsters had suddenly arrived at their doorstep. Barging through their doors, they wreaked havoc as they did what they like, looting and killing in their wake. Their police force fought bravely, but they were swiftly put down, and the people demanded her for a solution. Except that their only solution was banished to the moon above them. And it was all her fault. She naively thought that their meager police force and their history would have been enough to ward off any evil that might dare consider disturbing her utopia, but her hopes and dreams crumbled in front of her very eyes. It then died for good once the armored warriors swooped in from the skies and saved the day. Despite her pleas, her people turned on her, welcoming their saviors that she knew was responsible for this mess in the first place, with open arms, while casting her off her throne. Now she sat on a throne of shame a cold metal cod in the Mandalorian prison cell. The only thing she could do now was watch from behind bars the speech from her replacement. My people, I humbly thank you for welcoming me and your brothers and sisters home. Darth QB, the revealed leader of Death Watch, stood on the metal podium that overshadowed the remnants of Mandalor. His gleaming red armor shined like a blood-red ruby, painted by the bloodshed by his efforts and by his enemies. And speaking of enemies. Behind him were the bound, beaten, gagged, and humiliated leaders of the gangsters that dared to invade and spit on their home. The once proud and mighty gangsters were put on display, their bruised and broken eyes unable to look at the cameras pointed at them. Look at them, everyone. Gaze upon their true, pathetic selves a gang of bullies that chose to use their might to destroy and consume. They wanted everyone to think that they were untouchable that it's better to simply compromise instead of eliminate. Together, they helped create and maintain a broken system that promises meager rewards, while giving less while taking more. Well to hell with that. Darth QB spun around, his heel nearly crushing Jabba's right eye as he delivered a brutal kick. Enough with their bullshit. Enough with their tyranny. Enough with their greed. And enough of our cowardice. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And I think you all are tired of being on their side, am I right? The thunderous boos and cheers said everything he needed to hear. In the end, might always makes right. That's been the rule of the jungle since day one of creation. And yet, why does that have to mean tyranny and cruelty? In the end, we are evolved beings. We can choose to do better to be better. To choose when to be peaceful and when to be aggressive. The ignited is dark zipper, the ethereal hum reverberating throughout the dome. But like I said. Might makes right, but that does not make us unreasonable. I may be emperor, but I listen to my people. So do my people desire for these crime lords. Death. That single word echoed throughout the glass dome, heard through every corner of the galaxy through the eyes of a holodroid. Death to the criminals. Death to the terrorists. Death to them all. The voices of the people heard, Darth QB lowered his hand, and a rain of blaster fire finally put an end to the criminal underworld that was once feared and respected by the galaxy. The void of power was silent for a single moment before being filled by cheers, blaster fire, and the roar of ships and jetpacks of Mandalorian heritage. The throne was stiff, cold, and uncomfortable. He liked it. It served as a reminder of the responsibilities that came with it, much like the cold Mandalorian steel of the Dark Saber. It carried weight, history, and power that others would undoubtedly challenge him for time and time again, be it through combat or through politics. It was also rather uncomfortable to have Fex on, even though Darth QB was currently getting the kinkiest cowgirl effects from Bo Caton. So, are you going to uphold your end of the bargain? Darth QB purred, despite cold metal being pressed against his naked chest. Thunk you, Bo Caton gritted her teeth as she fought the urge to orgasm. She hated it. She hated it all. She hated how he succeeded where Vizsla failed. She hated how he tore him apart with ease. She hated how he never ordered the death of her and her supporters the minute she tried to defect, instead choosing to challenge her to a duel of politics instead of combat. She hated how she had no choice but to accept, knowing that doing so otherwise, well perhaps prideful, would serve to do nothing but drag them to their swift end. She hated how he won the duel, seizing Mandalor and eliminating their shady pawns in one swift move. She hated how only she cared about his hedonistic nature, and how he warmed the royal throne that once belonged to her sister with their bodies. She hated how he stripped down to his life day suit while ordering her to keep her armor on, penetrating her clothing and maidenhood with his beep alone. But most of all. Why does this feel so good? She groaned internally as he came deep inside her. This man was scum a disgusting pig of a man that would undoubtedly savor every riches, women, and power he could get his greasy fingers on. And yet, somehow, she could feel that, unlike the Jedi, Sith, or Mandalor of the past, he could and would succeed in his quest for domination. Yes, that was why she chose to submit. Perhaps he was Sith at heart, but he did still win the throne and the sword through legitimate means, as much as S5H5T7F hated to admit it. And besides she placed a hand over her belly, feeling his still rock heartbeat twitching inside her womb. He wields the power of the gods in his veins. 
it certainly would benefit Mandalor should the future warriors inherit his powers. As if that strange glowing power wasn't enough, he had an arsenal of otherworldly abilities that defined him as the perfect warrior. From the ability to boost his speed, strength, and even manipulate the power of the elements even most Jedi and Sith couldn't perform, he evidently could shapeshift and multiply himself as easily as one could breathe. Should he choose to do so, he could undoubtedly conquer an entire system himself, with an army of his ego, and will raising through cities and armies like a vibroblade through flesh. That sort of destruction power shared within her bloodlineate was almost potent enough to help swallow down the feelings of guilt, shame, and embarrassment she felt as her sister watched in horror, disgust, and morbid fascination from behind. Sister Satine Kriz gasped softly. Her royal, noble clothes were now rags, torn to tatters by the angered crowds, as she was paraded like the criminals they had brutally massacred. Her armored escorts did nothing to stop the assaults unless they grew near fatal, with bruised ribs being the worst she had received. Despite the humiliation, despite the complete defeat she and her ideology had suffered, she couldn't help but wonder and feel that perhaps she did deserve this. After all, a good leader was responsible for everyone's failures and successes. Don't get her wrong, she knew the Death Watch had everything to do with this assault and rescue her message that went disregarded and spat on, but in the end, she was enough of a woman to accept her defeat. That's why when she suddenly felt her body being gently lifted up by an invisible force, she said nothing. That's why when she glanced quickly at her sister who lay on the floor discarded like a used rag, covered in sweat and other fluids, she accepted that that was her fate as well. That's why when her clothes were violently torn off by the man's supernatural powers, she refrained from shivering in fear and from pleading for mercy. And that's why when her virginity was taken in a flash of pain and pleasure, all she did was let out a tear as she closed her eyes, trying to imagine that it belonged to the dashing young GD that had once charmed and saved her life. But that young GD was far, far away, meditating his troubles away in the comfort of that wretched temple of theirs. She didn't know about the Force or how it worked, but some part of her hoped that he would be able to feel her pain and sorrow. Just the pain. Not the sudden onset of pleasure that racked her body. Not how his vile man thing reached all the right places, and how she funking came too many times to count. Satine Kurz's eyes rolled to the back of her head as she felt him erupt deep inside her. His semen felt oddly hot, making her barely conscious body shiver a little, before she succumbed to the darkness. Ah. Ah. Nuo, not like Theus. Punking Kreef. In every civilized part of the galaxy with the Holonet, a live show of a strange, masked man ravaging two women in front of a throne. This would have been somewhat alright on its own, since it's hardly the first time a prankster have put such smutty films on the Holonet, except that it was Satine Kurz the leader of Mandalor and her sister Bo Katen, the infamous Death Watch Mandalorian. Greetings, worlds. The masked, robed figure stated. I am Darth QB, and, as of right now, I am the current ruler of Mandalor. Even as I speak, my forces are spreading across the many neutral systems, which are currently merging into my new empire. Under my new regime, there will be no more inequality. No more inhumane slavery. No more net lessifering. Holographic recordings then flashed into place. The many spice mines that served as a tomb for many of its slaves and underpaid workers. The lower levels of Coruscant filthy, polluted, dank, and dark. The GD temple, standing tall and luxuriously. The many Twi'leks living in poverty, forced to live as either slaves or playthings for huts. Born free Ta, who visited one of Coruscant's buffets. A Twi'lek child sitting in a dark alleyway, the many vehicles zipping by above him like the skyscrapers of the same planet, uncaring of his reduced state of skin and bones. The huts and the many criminal cartels, and their tyrannical empire of spice and slaves, built on the bodies of the innocent and rivals alike. The planet of Zegeria, before cutting to its surface the slave trade that was once thought to have been forbidden by the Republic, continuing on due to the lack of authority. The many bodies of Zegerians being thrown carelessly into a pile by the people they have once enslaved, burned to a crisp as they celebrated their new freedom and their new empire. The broken comb-covered mess that was once the Queen of Zegeria, with many more former slaves in line to relieve their pain onto her. All the criminal leaders' heads mounted on spikes on Mandalor, their expressions of horror still etched onto their rotting faces. In just a month, I have done far more than what your puny, lying oligarchy you call the Republic have done for the galaxy. In just a month, I have accomplished what the Jedi should have done so many millennia ago. In just a month, I have created what the Sith Empire of the old days could have become the solution. His eyes, which glowed harshly under its dark visor, burned with passion and hate, all the while the two women he was funking in front of the galaxy, continued to moan and flush. In time, more of my soldiers of Mandalor are traveling throughout the galaxy, inviting any system that feels that both the Republic and this new separatist government have failed. In time, both groups would crumble from their own selfish, misguided desire, the engineer of their downfall, the work of men who have lost their way or cannot see the bigger picture. 
Should you wish to join my new Sith Empire or should you require our assistance in your overblown spat you know how to contact me. Darth QP out. And with that, the forced holo transmission ended, leaving the galaxy stunned and in silence for one unified moment. Through the power of persuasion or military might, many systems were quickly finding themselves falling under the new Sith Empire. It was a slow process to be sure, but the fact that this new faction's influence was quickly spreading was very alarming for both the Republic and the Separatists. The fact that they themselves have lost worlds to this new empire through not might, but through pure diplomacy was an even larger concern, and the worst part was that neither side could legally engage in combat with this new empire as retaliation. Of course, that's not to say that it hadn't crossed their minds or even stopped them before, but, politically, they were both on thin ice with both neutral and their own worlds, so to act rashly without justification would have been political suicide. It didn't help that this emperor himself was spreading anti-propaganda against both sides, as well as misinformation and half-truths. The GD's only passion is to spite my kind the people who just wanted to live by our own rules from the start. Once upon a time, the Republic might have been the bastion of integrity and peace. But that time has long expired, the many supposed representatives having grown ignorant and greedy. That's why the Confederacy was born, and why, despite their overwhelming advantage, they seek not to dominate, but rather, to simply retain their independence from a tyrannical system that barely pretends to care about the people it promised to watch over. This is Emperor QP speaking. Unfortunately, I come with grave news. The rotten apple did not fall far from the rotting tree we call the Republic. For all their talks about independence and equality, the Separatists are no better. Thanks to the people of Ryleth and the remnants of the Zagerian slave empire, I have learned of their forceful occupation and their nefarious deeds. The Confederacy, under the strict orders from the former GD Count Duku, made plans to help restart the massive slave trade in exchange for wealth and passage. For concrete evidence of our discovery, go under the Holland at News Sith Empire databank to read the latest reports. My fist may be made of Besker, but I am fair. I view everyone as my equal and only wish for a stable and secure galaxy. Luxury and power shall be yours, so long as you give me the chance to grant you what you need. My new empire need not slaves, but loyal men and women willing to work or fight for what is needed and desired. So sign up today if you wish to learn the true meaning of power and justice, as well as to learn what it means to be a part of something greater. The Hot Clan have been allowed to coexist for many years, their existence tolerated because of their influence and money. The Old Republic, the former Sith Empires, the current Galactic Republic, and even the Separatists work with or around them, ignoring the suffering orchestrated by such scum and worlds like Ryloth, for the sake of treaties and profit. Let their rotting heads be a testament to my intolerance to such filth in this galaxy. But more lurk in the shadows and in the light. Do your part to avenge our friends and family and help me purge the filth from this galaxy. Ad Mamadala gulped as the Holonet propaganda rotated to the recycled videos of the major crime lords or what was left of them. Their rotting heads still mounted at Mandalor, the faces that were once feared in every dark corner of society were now openly mocked and spat upon, with their charred remains now even used as blaster practice. Throughout the holonet, more and more videos emerged of the new Sith Empire's victories. Pirates, war criminals, any scum of the galaxy were often tied to the stake, their crimes loudly repeated before they were executed by blaster fire, courtesy of the new recruits that seemed to multiply like droids who needed practice. This is atrocious, the senator of Naboo finally managed to say. Indeed. The galaxy is already in turmoil from the war. The last thing we need is this, her friend and fellow senator Bail Organa agreed. He winced as he accidentally swiped to one of the more infamous speeches which involved the shameless public intercourse with the Mandalorian Bo Caton. Right, well, that's enough of that, Padm said, shutting off the holonet device. We're here. Their ship, an H-type Nubian yacht, landed on a docking bay on Mandalor. Are you absolutely sure of this? Bail asked, clearly concerned. Yes. I'll be fine, Bail. Feel free to head back to Alderaan, since I'll be here a week tops. Besides she looked around at the various other ships of varying sizes and functions, and noted how a handful of them were clearly not of Mandalorian origin. I'm not the only senator looking for a treaty to be signed. So this could take a while. I still think this is a bad idea, the Alderaanian senator repeated. Perhaps. However, I need to try, Padm said as she stood up from her seat and descended the ramp down to exit onto the docking platform. Senator Amidala of the Republic. Two Mandalorian platform guards approached her, both female. Yes, do you need to see further clearances? Padm greeted them, but they shook their heads. You're fine, miss. Now, please follow us. Looking back at Bail one last time, she took a deep breath as she accepted their hand onto their speeder. Good luck one of the guards said coyly as the elevator door slid shut, and just like that, two senators stood awkwardly in the silent lift. Didn't think we'd both be here Mina, Padm said, trying to break the tension. 
it's been quite some time. How's Lux? He's doing fine, thank you, Pam, Mina Bonteri replied coolly. While they were friends and Mina even mentored the Nabubian senator, they were still on opposite sides of the war. Even if neither of them wanted the war to continue, the two of them still felt like they were walking on eggshells around one another. Did you know? About the atrocities committed by the faction I had given everything up to. No. Mina's stoic face turned dark as the datapad in her purse grew heavier. For all of their propaganda, the Republic and the new Sith Empire were right about one thing they were played for fools. The Techno Union, the Trade Federation, even Count Dooku they were all unofficially guilty of the many war crimes that rivaled the Republic's. It didn't make sense. It had to be a lie. And yet, the data said otherwise. Mission logs that were salvaged from deletion. Live recordings from both automated cameras and civilians. Confessions from the prisoners of war. Records of their business conducted to Anon Zegeria. And suddenly, Mina's faith in her new government began melting away, leaving nothing behind but bitter, somber silence. The elevator doors slid open, and they both gingerly stepped through, their nerves on fire as they passed by soldiers and politicians. The two women's faces flushed as they caught a few having passionate effects, no doubt part of the negotiation process going on. Or perhaps this new emperor was simply depraved. Either way, they just hoped that they wouldn't share the same fate. I the force pad mumbled upon seeing a green Twi'lek woman being choked via leash as a Zeltron woman funked her with a strap on from behind. The Twi'lek's face askew with pleasure now burnt into their minds, the two senators walked quickly along the halls filled with more effects and moans, trying to keep their eyes forward as they approached the Emperor's throne room. Greetings, Senator Mina Bonteri and Senator Pad Mamadala. May I offer you some of our finest Mandalorian wine? They nearly tripped over a repurposed tourist droid that held up a plate of snacks and refreshments. Normally, drinking on the job was considered unprofessional, save for after the meetings or in between breaks, but. The two seized their shots of wine and downed them in one go. They had to stop themselves from helping themselves to a second one, quickly finding that they missed the sweet taste that just seemed to melt their troubles away. The Emperor is expecting you too. The duo blinked, and they realized that they made it to the throne room, the only obstacle in their way a Mandalorian guard and a pair of doors. Please watch your step. The doors slid open, and the two women were blasted in the face with the smell and shrieks of Fex. The two senators' eyes were glued onto the side as the emperor dumped his load into the Twi'lek, the two letting out powerful roars of pleasure that shook the room before he carelessly shoved her aside. She fell into a naked, sweaty heap on the floor, rolling down the stairs of the throne. Ursa. Sabine. Be good girls and clean her up for me, would you? The two women, who looked quite miserable, simply nodded as they crawled over to the fallen Twi'lek, lapping up their master's fluids off and from her body. Now, then, let us get to the point. I assume you wish for me to either stop posting the faults and crimes of your respective governments. Or did you wish for me to join your cause, seeing as how my empire is currently neutral and is in control of a terrifying amount of systems? Yes. I was sent by the Confederacy of Independent Systems to try and see what we could do to get you to join our cause, Mina quickly compassed herself. It could have been the humidity or the overall atmosphere, but she felt herself tugging at her collar quite a bit, her body growing warmer by the second. Adam herself was not faring better. Her underarms were growing hot and humid, and she could feel a trickle of sweat pouring down her scalp. She was squirming far more than she was comfortable with, and she was reminded of her early days as royalty, learning how to remain stoic and proper under the eyes of millions. Perhaps drinking that wine was a mistake. Um, yes, the Confederacy. A noble cause, tainted and corrupted by those that branched off from the Republic. Your armies of metal funded and made by those that arguably initiated the unrest in the first place, gotten off scoffree by an incompetent count. The Republic does not subscribe to the idea of dictatorship, Padden protested. We are a democratic government representing hundreds of systems. Ah yes. The democracy that has and is failing everyone in the galaxy and let crime run rampant. Tell me, my dear, where was your democracy when the hot cartels bought Twilex as slaves? Where was it when Zegeria had its slave trade up and running? And didn't your own planet become taken over once by what would now become the Confederacy? Tell me, did the Republic's democracy help you then? Naruto asked as he descended the steps down towards the two senators, his beep swinging left and right like a pendulum. Well, no government is perfect, Padden cleared her throat, trying hard not to imagine the phlegm in her esophagus as his semen. There are certainly downsides to democracy, yes, but in the long run, it is the most efficient way to run a multi-system government. And, pray tell, just how long should everyone wait until the system is deemed too broken to be worth continuing? The new Lord of the Sith tilted his masked face. How long is long enough until the people decide that their leaders are unjust? Should it be when people begin to shrivel and expire from poverty, as their leaders fatten themselves with the people's hard-earned fortune? 
Should it be when war breaks out, their fury directed at oneself because they are too cowardly and ignorant to realize just where the problem truly stems from? Or should it be when even the representatives of the free systems have enough and secede in hopes of being able to create their own government? Though the Republic has stood over dozens of millennia, Padden weakly protested, her words dying as he stood right in front of her, his beat dangerously close to her married beat. Even after the fall of the Old Republic. The Old Republic was, when it still stood, at the peak of its time time which has long been expired. But even after surviving the old Sith Empire and even the reign of the Eternal Empire, even when peace was finally an option, they chose to not expand when they had the chance. At the cost of maintaining a pure image, they have neglected both the systems with and outside of the Republic. Even after they finally had time to breathe and rebuild, what did they do for every other system? Nothing. It was Mina Bonteri, who had fallen on her knees, that had finally answered. We did nothing. And how could we? We didn't have the will nor strength to try to restore order to every part of the galaxy. So selfishly kept it to ourselves. Exactly. So, again, tell me why should I expend my resources on two sides of the same rotting ship that's doomed to go down together? Mina and Padm looked conflicted. The smell and sounds of arousal and Fex consuming them, they knew that there was only one thing he could want in exchange for his help for the war that he deemed a joke. Now, now, you'll have to do better than that. The two senators nearly leapt out of their skins as they felt hands snaking around their bodies. Frozen stiff, they realized that it was the Mandalorian whores, a mother and daughter duo, by the looks of it, that the Emperor was sleeping with just minutes ago. Come on, aren't you the fearless senators willing to do whatever it takes for your system? Ursa Ren purred, her hands fondling Mina Bonteri's friests. The woman had shed her armor, her fairly large friests pushing against her soft, yet firm back. Stunned, tongue-tied, Mina desperately looked to the Emperor, then to Padden for help. The Emperor merely shrugged, an amused look undoubtedly behind that blank visor. And Pan. She wasn't faring any better. The daughter, a growing, little minx of a woman, long broken just like her mother, was even worse. Padm's freests and ass, both which were even bigger than Mina's, much to her silent envy, were being groped, massaged, ground, humped. What terrified her the most, however, was just how broken her eyes looked. Mina could see the hint of rebellion left in her eyes being drowned out by despair and acceptance of their master. A chill ran down her spine. Will we become like that, she wondered, broken and made to live to serve this perverse king's beep. But here was no choice. They knew exactly what the perverted emperor wanted. And if it could just help them turn the tides of their war. Lemon happened. Whoa, where did that come from? And why did that fantasy feel just right? Don't deny your own desires, the dark growled. Some were born to serve. I can grant you the permission you need to get on your knees if you so choose. The part she hated the most was of how right he was. Perhaps it was the stress of the job, perhaps it was due to how comfortable she had gotten at playing the handmaiden, but some part of her enjoyed servitude. In a way, it was freeing, not needing to make the hard choices to be the center of the galactic stage, as she made decisions that would crucify her one way or the other, be it by enemies or by comrades. None of that happened whenever she got to play the part of the handmaiden. Sure, it was exhausting to do the menial, manual work that others found beneath them. Sure, enduring the humiliation from the snobby nobles was always unpleasant. But she found that people were more true to themselves when they thought that they were in a position of power. She also found that it was far easier to go along with the flow like a ship coasting peacefully throughout the vastness of space. She would later blame the wine and the Dark Emperor's devilry, but she soon succumbed to those hidden desires. Before she knew it, her lips pressed against her new master's beep, tasting its salty greatness. Then it slipped past her lips, and she was made to service it. Memories melting like chocolate, blending in the pot of shame and hedonism, she remembered the blinding pain that erupted in her crotch when he entered her temple, followed by the planet-shaking pleasure that came with it. She forgot just how many kisses, suckles, and orgasms she gave and experienced. She forgot which of the girls she had kissed at some point. By the force, she could hardly remember if he had climaxed in her. All she knew was that, for the first time in forever, she truly felt free and relaxed, and a small part of her would hate to leave its alluring arms. Laying on the cold floor next to the various other whores, Pad Mamadala passed out. She didn't have that much wine, but she felt like throwing up. The aftereffects clarity didn't hit her right away, but when it did, she dry heaved. She couldn't believe what she had just done the people she had betrayed by succumbing to her temptations. The principles she had cast away like garbage. The sanctity of marriage she had spat on. The worst part of it was that she didn't know how much of it was truly his fault and how much of it was hers. What truly stung was his response to her sacrifice. In the end, the two of you made some very convincing arguments. However, I shall stand firm on my neutrality unless you two give me some reasons to back your pathetic war. Be it by droids, resources, credits, or even your flesh, come back to me if you wish to see more progress in this civil war. 
So in the end, both of them hard out for what might have been nothing. But still, the promise of his troops, resources, and power was much too large to ignore, and in the end, they were bound to his will either way. The whole recordings he made of their depraved actions made it rather hard to argue against his statement. It was all Padm could do in the shower to not weep from her shame and horror. Still, she told herself. This is all for the greater good. This was all for peace. At least, that mantra was the only thing that kept her going. She just hoped that Anakin wouldn't sense her betrayal. End chapter. So this part ends here. If you want to see next part of this series. Like the video now and share the story with your friends. Bye bye.